Before I begin, I just want to thank Turn Naveen. These are two absolutely extraordinary people uh, who are single-handedly, together, um, <laughs> leading, leading this um, vanguard of integrative medicine. And uh, uh, they sacrifice their lives, their houses, their, their, their time uh, for this. And, and it's been an, an immense, uh, immensely inspiring uh, progression. Um, they, they are leading uh, for this college of medicine now. Uh, and and I, I think today, you know, regard yourselves at the beginning of a, of a new era, uh, a history in the making, because the convention today, I think, will be an enormous convention and a movement of tomorrow, and, and they started it. So can we just give them applause? Yeah. Well, when I set off yesterday afternoon for London, um, my wife said, why on earth are you going uh, to London uh, and leaving us all on Saturday? Um, and I said, because it's really, really important. It really matters. Um, and it matters not only to our patients and the nation, but also in my own personal life, it's mattered a great deal because integrative medicine saved my life. Um, I remember being at the GP 10 years, a very conventional GP, and I remember driving into work one morning, it was raining in Devon, and I thought, can I stand another day of surgery seeing patients who are chronically tired, who have back pain, who are stressed, who are depressed, irritable bowel, um, uh, ME, with nothing in the cupboard to offer them? You know, can I take the frustration of yet another day in surgery, leaving them empty handed, with frustrations on both sides? And that was when things clicked for me on a personal level. And I regard what we're talking about over the next two days as medicine and power. It's, uh, it's, it's medicine, it's about relationships, just as Tony said. It's about respecting the fact that uh, we are healers, whether we're patients, doctors, nurses, or therapists. Um, so I think what we're discussing here is something very much at the moment. And uh, what I want to do uh, in the next uh, uh, while is to look at some of the current challenges because there are quite a few and most of you will know those. I want to say why I think we are uh, on the cusp of a new era. Uh, to talk a bit about social prescription, primary care networks, and then uh, take you down to Devon for a taster of uh, life there in general practice. Um, so it's a bit like this um, when it comes to complementary medicine and the health service today. Um, storm clouds everywhere. Um, we've got uh, a very conventional, rather angry lobby that is very opposed to complementary medicine. And I call it scientism because it's not science. It's because people are purely looking at the biomedical and not incorporating the psychosocial, not including the relationships, the minds that Toes just mentioned and, and illustrated. Um, and then we've got the nice guidelines. Um, obliterating um, complementary medicine. We, we had back pain a few years ago where sensible guidelines suggesting manipulation, acupuncture and the rest now withdraw. Acupuncture now withdrawn from most of the NICE guidelines, the palliative care guidelines changing. So we've got, if you like, right at the top, the scientists rejecting, um, uh, uh, rejecting complementary medicine. Um, and even NHS England is turning its back uh, with the abolition of homeopathic and herbal medicines uh, just recently in the last few months. Very bitchy because um, the total spending on those homeopathic and herbal medicines was £90,000 a year. And yet we spend well over £100 million a year on constipation medicines alone, all of which could be, or most of which could be sorted by proper lifestyle and the rest. So this was just simply, uh, if you like, a, as I said, a bit of bitchery, really. The G College of GPs sent out, it's told GPs like myself, we should no longer uh, be practicing homeopathy. What a terrible cheek. I wrote to the chair at the time and said, one, I wasn't going to do anything about what she said. It wasn't the current one, I should say. Uh, but secondly, I thought this was McCarthy's at its worst. How intolerant can you be of patients and clinicians by telling them what sort of medicine 
they should be practicing. And it made me really quite angry. And uh, as a fellow of the College of GPs, um, I said they must start listening to people who are actually on the, the, the front line, listen to the patients. And, and, and I heard a, a wonderful interview, the new president of the Faculty of Homeopathy on the Today program um, was battling it out with the BMA. And at the very end of the program, he said very gently, uh, with John Humphreys on one of his last days in the Today program, he said, um, uh, look, I, I take all you've said, but why don't you just come down to my surgery? Why don't you just meet the patients who've been helped? Why don't you just talk to them instead of just barracking away? Um, and then we find some complementary practitioners saying this is good that the NHS is against us because that gives us greater currency. And, and that's a real pity for me because I feel um, I would like all patients to be able to access these things and not just those that can pay. But, as I say, there were two views. Why are people so opposed to complementary medicine? Well, they say there's no evidence. Um, and I think that is a bit rich because I think there's lots of evidence uh, for lots of complementary therapies. Um, but perhaps not always in the vernacular and the language of conventional medicine, let's say double-blind placebo-controlled trials, which may be very relevant for heart attacks and uh, cancer, but possibly not so relevant for much of the long-term disease, which is 80% of what we see in medicine today. Um, and it is a bit rich because no one's funded the research anyway. 0% of the NHS budget was spent on uh, research in complementary medicine um, uh, in the last three or four years. Uh, and it's also been the wrong sort of evidence um, because what we need is very practical evidence. What I need as a GP is if someone's got a headache, which is better and more cost effective? Is it seeing an acupuncturist? Is it taking tablets or is it doing this or that? There's very, very little of that sort of evidence. There was some a few years ago. There's a wonderful trial done, and it's great to hear someone coming from Belfast, because it was in, uh, in, in, in Belfast. Um, uh, and they took some GP practices, and the doctors were able to offer free um, patients homeopathy, or herbal medicine, or manipulation. Um, and the results of that were pretty alarming in terms of patients improving, their health improving, the, the GP saying that it had uh, been a really positive experience for them, rather like Toe, they found their um, surgeries were emptying out because um, uh, people uh, were being treated elsewhere. And this was an incredibly positive study, and then uh, we, a number of us said, let's do that study in England. And Alan Johnston was then the Secretary of State for Health, uh, and he said, yes, let's do it. And we formed a committee, and we had Sir Cyril Chandler, who was going to chair that, to look at what uh, were the cost effectiveness of GPs being able to refer patients to complementary practitioners. And then he was made Home Secretary. And very sadly, after that, um, the current Secretary of State, which uh, I've been barracking, have not put the money towards that. But until we've got that sort of evidence, it's very rich to say there's no evidence, because no one's prepared to actually gather it in the first place. Um, and I think personally, you know, I've never seen a, an average normal patient. It would be nice one day to, but uh, we're all different. You know, we all have different aspirations, hopes, and different mechanisms, and some treatments help and some don't. And uh, we are totally disrespectful now of the N equals one treatment, the personal testimony. Everything has to be the imposition of population based medicine. And I suppose, for me, the message of integrative medicine is about changing that uh, paradigm, which is the scientists produce the evidence, the clinicians interpret it, and then the patient, like Alexander Beetle, if you remember Alexander Beetle at the end of Winnie the Pooh's walk in the woods, the patient, like Alexander Beetle, being the recipient of all this great wisdom and this clinical advice. That is yesterday's medicine. Tomorrow's medicine is the patient at the center. The patient listening to the clinician, if uh, the clinician seems to be saying wise words, and then that clinician using the evidence uh, that he's got, but it being based upon the patient, not upon the system. I hope in the future that our uh, uh, clinicians won't simply be the purveyors of population-based medicine. They round down on their poor patients using clinical pathways, but without even thinking or accepting the individuality of, how, of what we are. And then there's the safety argument. I have so much said about the lack of safety of complementary medicine, and how rich can that be when 
2,000 patients a year die from anti-inflammatory drugs. And, uh, and you know, even uh, I, I read last week uh, something quite simple like ranitidine, which has reduced the city of the stomach, is suddenly uh, becoming something that's withdrawn from uh, most of the pharmacies in, in America. And almost every day there's a scare of some conventional treatment or other. Uh, certainly complementary medicine on the whole is very safe. Um, and uh, in turn, the lead a leading a movement uh, to try and make sure that as many complementary practitioners as possible know about red flags, because I think that will make it even safer. And I should add that the osteopath in my surgery in the last uh, two years has uh, referred to me uh, one person with uh, secondary cancer, another with giant cell arteritis, uh, and another with a malignant melanoma, um, which would not have been picked up if he hadn't actually sent them to me um, at an early stage. So, you know, to me, the safety is, 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 is it's much safer if we work together. And the trouble is we don't, there's a communication block. Two studies have shown that 50% of the time, patients don't feel that they can talk to their conventional doctor if they are taking a complementary remedy or seeing a complementary practitioner. That's terrible. Um, and, uh, and, and it's fairly consistent. Uh, and whose fault is that? I don't think it's the complementary therapist. I think it's because conventional medicine has made them scared because they feel they're going to be judged. And that's really dangerous. If you're taking St. John's Ward and then you put somebody on uh, you know, the pill, you know, they might get pregnant and etc. It's very really important that there's that communication. And then regulation. Regulation is such a sad uh, story. I mean, we, we fought for herbal regulation two or three years ago. Regulation of herbal therapists and Secretary of State then actually produced the thing saying, Yes, we're going to regulate the uh, herbal practitioners. And then, unfortunately, uh, another Secretary of State took over, this happens the whole time, um, and that Secretary of State said, No, we're going to have a third inquiry. There'd already been two inquiries where the clinicians and the patients had said they definitely wanted regulation. So, no, we're going to have another inquiry. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, with the influence of some malignant royal colleges, uh, regulation was refused. And the main reason, which came from some of the uh, heads of the royal colleges, was we should not be regulating nonsense. Uh, if we start regulating herbal practitioners, then we are giving some credibility to herbal medicine. We don't believe in it, so it shouldn't be regulated. Um, the college's uh, reply on that, uh, incidentally, was one, lots, thousands and thousands of people who see herbal practitioners, so regardless of what you think about herbal medicine, surely it's important and safe. Um, and furthermore, the BME population are disproportionately high in their use of herbal medicine. So you're, you're saying to some of the most vulnerable people in the community, we're not going to bother doing any regulation, we don't care. Um, and the reason why it was refused was the politicians were afraid of some very powerful, very dyed-in-the-wool conventional practitioners. And I just hope we won't see the sort of shameful affairs appear in the future. And the way to do it is safety in numbers. It's, it's this convention that become bigger and bigger to create networks and really start uh, demanding a slightly better attitude from those on high. Well, 20 years ago, it wasn't quite as bad. 20 years, when I joined my practice 40 years ago, um, uh, one part was doing homeopathy, another part was doing manipulation. It's quite usual for GPs to, 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 to do integrated medicine. Uh, this is the sort of quote you might have seen at the time, um, which was actually in one of the medical journals in 1997. Um, and this was another quote from the same article. And I'm giving you these quotes because you'll be slightly surprised as the two authors who co-authored this particular paper. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> some people decided, for reasons best known to themselves, to suddenly become enemies of the very thing that they had tried to uh, support over so many years. Anyway, the dawn is rising. Things are about to get much, much better because of a disaster. Never waste a good catastrophe, they say. Um, the current medical vernacular is not working. Um, things are getting worse in spite of more and more money, more and more clever plans and strategies, public health, etc., etc. 
the levels of obesity, diabetes, long-term disease, depression, all going up in spite of our efforts. So we're not actually succeeding with our current state of affairs. Worse still, we are caught in what those optimists at the Department of Health call the scissors of doom. Uh, and the scissors of doom are the upgoing blade, which is the increasing costs of the health service, um, increasing numbers of patients with dementia, increasing costs of new drugs, elderly population, I've got 20 to, two times as many 70 plus year olds in my practice as I had 25 years ago, and in this blade, the decreasing amount of money to pay for it, and the decreasing number of doctors and nurses, and people that want to become GPs in my particular well, part of the world. So, um, we're caught in that, so we're heading for the rocks, um, and that has to change the way we think. We're over-medicalized too. The British Medical Journal started itself a campaign to stop the over-medicalization of the population. We're beginning to realize that this is happening, and there's a wonderful world movement, which I'd only recently heard of, called Quaternary Prevention, which is a, a movement that is fighting against the overuse of drugs that are harming people. And shamedly, 11% of the population long term, about 25% short term, we are coshing. We're coshing with depression, <laughs> drugs for depression, sleeping, or pain. Um, often, patients whom we can't diagnose, but whom the mutual agreement is, well, you know, let's just give you this stuff and uh, uh, cross our fingers. Um, and it's atrocious. You all know about the opiate issues going on in America. There's a not far off the scene here in this country. And then NICE reduces the risk of uh, coronary artery disease when we have our computers and you come in and you're 60 year old, normal blood pressure, normal sugar, active, uh, to 10%, which means that almost every patient over 60, certainly the males, will now have to put on statins if we obey. But thankfully, if you talk to many GPs, they think this is really absurd. And, uh, and I think the revolution is beginning even, even there. Um, the thing that's changed the conversation, though, quite um, <coughs> substantially over the last year, is the report that came from Bristol showing that uh, GPs with interest in complementary medicine used antibiotics 25% less. Now, this has really put the cat amongst the pigeons, um, because on Thursday, the college had a meeting at the, uh, uh, the Chelsea Physic Garden, which in which we started exploring what were the alternatives um, for uh, things like uh, upper respiratory tract infections and the like. Um, NICE, bless its heart, has at last, for instance, accepted pelagonium, which I've been using for 15 years, and which is the third most used over-the-counter medicine in Germany, uh, as uh, a self-care uh, proven uh, product for upper respiratory tract infections. But on the whole, if you go to the NHS website, if you've got a cough, you've got a cold, you've got a sinusitis, the advice is rest, lots of fluids, uh, and painkillers, which leaves us very bare as GPs when often people are saying we want an antibiotic because that helped us last time, and we're not going to leave until they give us an antibiotic. But if all you can say is rest and hot fluids and whatever, um, it's just not a very convincing story. So we met on Thursday to try and look at what were the various things that you could offer in terms of diet, in terms of uh, complementary therapies and medications. Um, and I thought that was going to be a rather little insignificant meeting with about 20 or 30 of us. Until we found uh, that we sent letters to NICE, Public Health England, NHS England, and the Chief Medical Officer, uh, all of whom wrote, uh, couldn't attend a short notice, saying, will you please uh, write this up because we need to know it. And then, from the head of um, Department of Health, said, can you produce a briefing note after this note for the Minister? A sudden recognition that even if they thought that complementary medicine was a load of tosh, at least it might help them to overcome 
uh, the, the problem with antibiotics. And you know, something like a million people a year are already dying from resistance to antibiotics, and that's going to double in 10 years. Um, and uh, unless we get a hold on this, it, it, it will happen. So, so in a way, the, 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 the movement, the tectonic plates are moving in terms of priorities. And if complementary medicine, integrated medicine is seen as a way of reducing over-medicalization antibiotics, that is, I think, a really important door in. As is personalised care. Personalised care is now national policy. There's a personalised care unit at NHS England. I work within it in my role as national champion for social prescription. And that is trying to bring in personalised care. What is personalised care? Well, it's about caring for the person, not just putting population-based medicine and telling them to take it or leave it. So I think the revolution is beginning to happen in all sorts of interesting ways. And um, we've got powerful um, advocates. Um, Prince of Wales has been saying this for many years. Um, uh, he wrote an article in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine saying as much. Um, and though they don't know it yet at NHS England, they are, uh, their policy is, is in leading inevitably towards this as well because the more you look at self-care, the more um, the complementary and integrated approaches apply. And it was interesting because a few years ago I brought together the leaders of the BMA, the General Medical Council, uh, all the Royal Colleges to discuss self-care. And I said, is there in fact a slightly different level of evidence that's appropriate when we suggest that people self-care from what we actually suggest when we're doctors? And they said, yes. They said, uh, and bless them, they recognise the fact that if you activate someone in their self-care, um, that's 30 or 40% likely to work before you start it, let alone what you actually suggest. And there was a recognition that we don't have to have double-blind placebo-controlled trials uh, in terms of self-care, provided it's safe, provided it doesn't, people, people are not uh, not taking a treatment that would really help, um, then surely uh, that, that evidence space can be a bit different. So I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say is I think our, our is coming, and I think you know, Toe and Naveed are the ringleaders of a revolution that is going to come and stay. Um, and um, it's great to have Dr. Matai here from India because uh, only last April the, uh, the Prime Minister of India, recently re-elected, Modi, and the Prince signed an agreement to bring Ayurvedic medicine to this country. Uh, a project which Dr. Amit in the front row there is going to be leading, uh, but which we hope will spread the whole concept of uh, a different approach in, in terms of yoga, in terms of diet, in terms of um, uh, various different treatments. So there are all sorts of sparks igniting all over the place. Now, one thing that I think is really going to move this very fast is social prescription. Um, and um, who in this room knows what social prescription is? Great. And who doesn't really know? Great. Right. Good. So, so well, that's great that you do. And uh, actually, extraordinary, because if I talked to an audience four or five years ago, nobody knew what it was at all. Um, and it was only three or four years ago that a group of us decided to make an international movement. It was just after uh, we'd done a study in my own practice looking at uh, the social prescribing facilitator being able to uh, convert a third of our diabetics and pre-diabetics to no longer being so. We thought, well, we need to make this into a national movement. So we, I grouped together friends, Chris Drinkwater from Newcastle, who was uh, helping uh, people who are unemployed by forming fishing clubs. Uh, and there was uh, uh, James Fleming in Burnley, where people die younger than anywhere else in the country, who uh, was invented something called Green Dreams. He said to himself one day, I have depressed people coming to my surgery saying they can't get work because unemployment level is highest there in the country. Uh, why am I giving them Prozac? Why aren't I uh, giving them uh, some means of getting a job? And from then onwards, he started prescribing occupational experience and the like. So we've got all of those together. We formed a group of 12. We then had a first meeting of 100 in London. We then had a meeting in the House of Commons. 
And then um, various MPs came along and ministers and they said, well, actually, we need to make this policy. And to cut a very long story short, it is now national policy within workers throughout the country. Why am I telling that story? Because that's what I think we need to do with integrative care. Um, that's to say, a few interested people together today, then we need to create a policy, storm the politicians, get people behind us, and then uh, take a march. Because whatever the conventional establishment says about evidence, what really matters in terms of getting things going is a critical mass of people. Um, that's what really changes things. So, social prescription. Um, who is it for? Well, really for almost all patients. 20% of my patients have a social problems, so why on earth aren't I giving them a social solution? Why am I giving them a medical solution? Um, the higher users of GP services, I mean hospital services, this is very counter-intuitional. But the, uh, in Rotherham they've taken the 2 or 3% that most use hospital services, and they found that they can reduce their use of hospital services by 20%. But that's only in the first year. Take the over 80s, five years later, they're using hospital services 50% less. It's staggering that, you know, once people start having a meaning in their lives, interests, occupations, relationships, they, they don't call upon health services as much. Um, those are the worst health risks. That's why we look at people with diabetes, but mental health very much so too. But, you know, we're beginning to look at loneliness and, and, and uh, in Belfast again. Goodness, everything's going in Belfast, the women's prisons. We are uh, introducing social prescription there with a view to looking at social prescription uh, going nationwide in prisons because it's pretty obvious that if someone comes out of the prison, unless they've got a job and a meeting and something to go to, they're going to reoffend, which they do. Um, and now increasingly we're beginning to say, well, why do we wait till people are 75 or 80 and they've got five or six long term diseases and they're using hospital services more? Why on earth don't we get them when they've got that one long term disease? and change their lives so they don't get the second, third, fourth and fifth. So there's almost no end to the uh, patient groups for which social prescription becomes relevant. And it's, I think its uh, popularity is its total simplicity. That's because all it is is a prescriber who is a GP today but who could be anyone tomorrow, including the patient themselves. Um, referring someone to a link worker who gets to know that patient, gets under their skin, has half an hour, is non-clinical, incidentally, and motivationally trained quite often, but who can find out what the issues are. Are they lonely? Then maybe an intermatic group, or maybe some, some walking group or whatever, or uh, is it uh, overweight, in which case they might look at nutrition, exercise, whatever. Uh, some, all sorts of uh, different uh, sorts of activities uh, referred uh, as a result. So it's a, it's a three three-way thing. And interestingly, lots of people have criticised me and said that why is it called social prescription? That the medics say, um, uh, you know, it's far too fluffy to be called uh, prescription. Um, the non-medics say, why are you medicalising it by calling it a prescription? Um, uh, and it's about 50-50, so I think we're probably in the right position because certainly the name seems to have caught on. Um, but that's how it is. Very, very, very simple. And I say the prescriber can be just about anyone. Um, the, the health advisor, they've got lots of different names. In Scotland, they call them um, community connectors. Um, in, uh, in, in, in Somerset, they call them village agents. Um, uh, I've just formed an institute down southwest in Fro, which is an extraordinary place where they've shown that they can reduce use of GP and hospital service by 20%. They have created on the back of the link workers a whole uh, range of what they're calling community connectors, who are lay people who work with them that connect people in fro to other people for services uh, or voluntary voluntary uh, occupations that they might interest them. And their aim is that every citizen in fro eventually is a community connector, and that will create the thing that Toe referred to right at the beginning, which is relationships and people being uh, working for their common good. Um, uh, the element that, that, that actually makes a difference is something called patient activation. You measure what we call the patient activation score. The degree to which that often that person who often, to begin with, had poor self-esteem, who was on the downers, who didn't think that they were either worth helping, let alone able to help themselves, uh, 
to the extent to which they become masters of their own destiny. And this seems to be the crucial thing, because from that, everything else happens. The way they look, the way they behave, their friends, their communities, everything starts changing around them. Uh, they, they no longer become me, they become something else that is uh, more uh, in a positive place than they were before. This, for instance, in my own practice, that diabetic study I talked to was what happened to the patient activation in those patients. So um, you can see the orange is the activated there, which not very many to begin with, but uh, almost more than half by the end. Um, and what we found is quite a lot of people lost weight in our study, but the ones that carried on with the weight loss in years two, three, four, and five were the ones where the whole center of gravity had moved. And the medical activities were as long as you're on. Um, but clearly complementary therapies are uh, very much part of it. Uh, in my own practice we do yoga, we do tai chi, uh, we have group uh, uh, sitting exercises uh, and all sorts of other things and Pilates and all these things are part of the menu, are part of changing the, the relationship between a patient and or what they feel they can do for themselves. And what it's doing I think is quite interesting because part of it is the link worker replacing me as I was 35 years ago. That's uh, giving a very personal care to the patient, having a relationship. The things I can't do nowadays because there's not enough time uh, and I don't know all the various things that are available. So part of it is personalising care. Um, but it's also uh, addressing inequalities because it's going to those who are most least able to help themselves. So uh, the ones that actually cost the health service most and the ones that are perhaps unhappiest and least uh, uh, content and satisfying lives. Um, it's demedicalizing clearly because it's saying to doctors in the health service that it's not just drugs and procedures that make the difference. All these other things can equally do. It's activating, as I said. But you know, the long term, the reason why I'm in this is not for social prescribing because I think it will be gone in 10, 20 years time. It's because of its catalytic effect, not only on individuals, but also on the community. Because what we're finding is, as it develops, the, uh, the offer locally increases. The link workers find there's gaps in the services, or there's insufficient capacity, and therefore they have more volunteer groups, more social capital in that community. And eventually, the aim is that instead of living in communities that make us ill and alienated, we eventually live in communities that actually make us well because, uh, I hope social describing will be the catalyst here, we've created uh, enough around for people to actually start caring for each other again. Um, lots of economic evidence. Uh, as I said, 20% we go to uh, those three, but also Croydon now and Frome and increasing studies. It seems to be 20% all around, this reduction. But uh, we haven't pushed the vote out on it yet, so this is just the beginning. Um, and uh, you can see all the evidence if you want to on the National Social Prescribing Network website. If you just go onto that website, uh, uh, you can see the evidence that we've got. But what we now need, I, I think, interestingly, uh, only a year or two ago people said, well, what is the evidence for social prescription? And we struggled a bit because we didn't have double blind placebo control trials, we just had a lot of field trials. But now it's national policy, no one seems to ask that question anymore. Um, and uh, the question now is where does it work best for who and in what way? Frankly, I think that's the question we should be asking anyway. Um, and it's probably, interesting, even though the evidence isn't that good, um, it's uh, probably the best evidence based on NHS policy. This is, uh, came from a paper at a research conference recently. Um, which probably doesn't say much for NHS policy, but it says a bit for social description. Um, so what's the current situation? Well, it's now national policy in England. Um, uh, there's a link worker potentially in every primary care network. That's a group of practices covering a population of about 30,000 um, from July. Um, in uh, the next two or three years, we hope to raise that to two or three link workers. So it's actually happening at the moment. Um, uh, we formed an institute which is going to develop the test bed sites and celebrate um, those that are furthest ahead and, and look at what you know, the factors and, and how that works. And um, GPs love it. I mean, Toe is a classic example. Uh, a lot of them, when it's not there, GPs say, oh, we don't want another thing. For heaven's sake, just keep moving. But once it's there, once it happens, once the patients are talking about, once they're not coming with their social problems, GPs really like it. Uh, and as I say, it's making a difference there. 
So, what's the um, relationship to integrative health? Well, um, first of all, clearly, uh, complementary practitioners need to get on the lists of those link workers. But also, I think you need to develop your repertoire so that you can be seen to be helping the community. And uh, it's lovely to see Trevor here, who is the hypnotist in my GP practice, who offers uh, self-hypnosis training and breathing techniques free to patients on Mondays uh, uh, as part of the offer. And, uh, and I think that's something that complementary practitioners need to, to be thinking about because in the same way as conventional medics, it's no longer going to be just the 10 minute consultation. I'm going to have to be going into the schools, the supermarkets and everywhere else. I think for complementary practitioners and the industry of medicine to meet its real potential, it needs to be becoming part of the community information system uh, and, and a resource for improving local health. Um, go to Rotherham, which is one of the most advanced um, um, social prescribing economies. They're already using uh, complementary alternatives and raising hundreds of thousands of pounds from the CCG to do so. Interesting, the CCG would never dream in a million years putting its money towards uh, social prescribing, but with social prescribing, the patients are uh, uh, voting with their feet, the link workers are, uh, are asking for the things that they want, and complementary medicine, if you like, through the back door, or you could call it to look commissioning, is actually beginning to, to get a hold. Um, personal health budgets, uh, these are on the rise. These are going to become very big. For people uh, requiring quite a lot of care, they will in the future be given their money and they'll be able to decide. And that opens the door strongly for integrative medicine. So if you go to Neen, for instance, which has been one of the test bed sites, you can see that uh, patients are already paying from their budgets for these treatments. Interestingly, when they use their budgets, they're not spending them. Everyone thought personal budgets were a terrible idea because everyone would overspend their budgets and then they'd be coming back to the NHS and getting a double helping. It's not actually happened in practice. Um, but then primary care networks um, quickly coming into happening. Um, and my job now with primary care networks is to make sure that social prescription doesn't become just another transaction, another funding mechanism coming through it, but it really does transform what medicine does and what the, the, the local tapestry is. And I think that's going to be the challenge for integrative medicine too, to make sure that we're not just talking about consultations, we're also talking about changing the conversation generally. So um, I thought in the last uh, five minutes or so, I'd take you down to Devon um, to either see what you might call a very peculiar practice, or you may think it's a practice of the future. Um, all I can say <coughs> is that at 67, I'm still really enjoying being a GP because of this. Uh, and this is largely made by the patients. Um, and that's, to me, so, um, it's, it's, it's so warming and inspiring. Um, we call ourselves the Calm Valley Integrated Centre for Health. My, uh, partners swallowed a bit when I said that was going to be our name a few years ago, um, because Integrated didn't have such a, a positive response in those days. Um, and this is the entrance, you have to go through the um, uh, fruit and vegetable gardens, which the patients um, uh, do in the car park, and then there's a herb garden, um, growing all the different herbs. Um, uh, this is a sort of green man here, before we planted, and all the herbs are in the various parts of the, um, of the man. Um, Brown uh, was one of our first gardeners, uh, and I remember him taking me around the garden one day. He said, Well, Doc, you know, tell me what all these are for. And I said, Well, this is uh, uh, lemon balm, very good if you want to help people to sleep. This is red sage, very good if you've got flushes. Uh, and here's St. John's Wall, good for depression. And I thought no more of it, but we suddenly found a bit like turn social prescribing. But, so, people weren't coming into the surgery quite as much. And I thought, well, that's fishy. Um, so I came out the front door and went round to the side. And Brian had lined up a whole row of plants labelled, uh, saying, um, if you're getting hot flushes, here's some of the If you're not sleeping, make yourself up some lemon balm. Not only that, he was accosting patients as they came to the surgery, uh, asking them what their problem was. <laughs> And then selling him a little pot, for which power went into surgery funds, uh, which was great, uh, and doing it. Um, I, I have to say, I had 
several sleepless nights after that, just waiting for the GMC to come and knock on my door and say what, what the hell was happening when the clock took it. So, uh, fortunately, say, we have powerful friends as well. This is an Anton Chekhov garden we've now got. We got a silver gold at Hampton Court last year. And this is a reproduction of um, uh, Anton Chekhov, who was a, a writer, but also uh, a doctor and also a herbal, herbalist. Um, uh, and this is a reproduction of his um, uh, garden south of Milosevic, south, south of Moscow, Milosevic. And um, he said, um, medicine is my wife, but writing is my mistress. And, uh, <laughs> and this is the garden. Garden, the, the patients love it. I mean, it's very skittish. What on earth is an Anton Chekhov garden doing in the middle of Clumpton, Devon? But, you know, they love it. And uh, lots of people come around and see it and, uh, and talk about the herbs and, uh, and, and the rest of it. Um, we have a cafe, which is really not only about healthy eating and teaching diabetics healthy cooking, it's more though about creating a social media and the various groups like the um, chronic myalgia groups and the diabetes groups and back pain groups and uh, all meet in the cafe uh, and sell support there. And we have walking groups of various different uh, gradation for the patients. It's crucial to have leadership. Um, this is the leadership group that we have. Um, my hope, a bit like the Community Connectors and Throne, is uh, that eventually every patient is a member of the surgery rather than a registered patient. Um, so far, we've got these, we've got 200 um, uh, people on email who, if you like, are friends and helpers. But eventually, I hope we'll just change the whole conversation because the health service is not sustainable if it's simply uh, money and professionals and all the rest of it. It's, it, it. We've created this NHS where it's a fantastic, it's a world leader in terms of its values of everyone uh, helping each other to make sure that no one who falls ill can't afford treatment, you know, which is so crucial at the time in America. 50% of bankruptcies are because people fall ill. You can just imagine the unhappiness of that. So we've created this wonderful system, but what we've never done is invested sufficiently at ground level in enabling people to look after themselves, but also encourage them to look after each other and create part of a community that's self-healing. And, and I hope that integrative medicine and, and, self, and social prescription will do that, because if we don't do that, we are lost as a health system. We will be unaffordable. And uh, uh, we'll just end up either with the rich getting good treatment or health and collapsing altogether. So I feel that this mobilization of patients, patient power, is probably the most crucial moment, movement in the NHS today. We have Tai Chi, we've got uh, 12 different complementary practitioners. Um, and, uh, and I believe that, uh, you may have seen this before, um, which is this, uh, this came from Bhutan. Uh, which I visited quite recently. Um, you may know about Bhutan. They measure gross domestic happiness, um, and, uh, uh, and not only nationally, but also in each of the companies. And it may sound a bit fluffy. It's not. It's a very, very tightly controlled um, statistical analysis of exactly uh, what is the state, for instance, of uh, a worker in a company in terms of their leave, their relationships, their psychological status, and all the rest of it. And uh, it's a wonderful idea. And this is something I saw one of their temples, and, and I'll probably get this wrong, and I'm sure Isaac will correct me, but it's, it's a bird on top of a rabbit on top of a monkey on top of an elephant. And, and I think the idea is the bird collects the seed, um, and then the rabbit pees on it, and the monkey does something else on it, and then the elephant digs it in, and it becomes a tree of life. Um, and that, I believe, is what integrative medicine is about, that's what social prescribing is about, and that's where we're all heading. Uh, and it's about mobilizing people, it's about self-care, it's about the individual, it's about relationships, and it's not about this ghastly vernacular at the moment of, of, of population-based medicine literally just saying it's the only thing and everyone's got to, uh, got to conform to its march. So, I leave you with a slide, and I leave you with a decision to make yourselves. Is this, um, is this a volcano about to explode? We're all going to die, no hope. Or is this uh, sunlight dawn coming behind an extinct volcano? Um, my mind is that. Thank you.